You are now listening to the Bayshore Community Church Podcast. Our mission is to connect to God, connect to people, and to serve the community. Thank you for joining us today and wherever you are listening. We hope that this message inspires you, encourages you, and transforms you. Our prayer is that this is just the beginning of a conversation between you and Jesus. Enjoy the message. Well, what's up, Bayshore? How are you guys doing this morning? Man, it is so good to see you guys today. This is like one of my favorite times of the entire year. We got Christmas music, which is amazing. It is September, which means college football has started, which has been awesome. Um, Also, pumpkin-flavored donuts at Dunkin'. You guys into that? I've been eating pumpkin-flavored donuts since like the middle of August. They are... They are absolutely amazing. This is such a great time of year. We got an amazing long holiday weekend to relax a little bit. We got the NFL starting up on Thursday night. Man, it does not get better than this. So great time of year, great Sunday to be at church. And, uh, and we're so glad that you are here today hanging out with us. And uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Cotter, and I am one of the pastors here at Bayshore. And uh, at Bayshore, we are one church, but we've got four locations. So we've got our Rehoboth campus right here in the basement. We've got our original Millsboro campus. We have our Fenwick Island campus. And we have folks in our online campus that join us online through Facebook, through YouTube, every single week. People that listen to the podcast every single week. So can we make some noise for everybody that's watching online this morning? So I am thankful for everybody that's watching online. I am thankful for you guys that are in the building. You want to know something I am not thankful for? I am not thankful for snakes. Is anybody else with me? Man, I, I cannot stand snakes. Like there is not many things that get me bummed out like snakes. And I think that's biblical. Like it was a snake that tempted Eve in the garden. Like they're evil. They're awful. They move weird. They're creepy. Just not a fan. And, and, um, and so a few weeks ago, I was hanging out with my son, and it was like one of the few days in the last month that it was not 120 degrees outside. And so we were walking around in the backyard, and he's like pointing at the trees and stuff. And, uh, and we come to this one tree that's kind of in the corner, and we've got, it's like a corner of our fences behind it. And there was a spider behind this tree that was no joke, the biggest spider that I've ever seen in my whole life. And like, I, I'm serious, I think it was the biggest spider ever on the Delmarva Peninsula. Like this thing was massive. And, and spiders usually don't bother me. Like if there's a small spider, I'll kill it with my hands. I'm not, I'm not worried about spiders usually. But this thing, this thing was serious. I think we got a picture we can, we can throw up on the screen. Do you see that thing? I, I don't know. All right, you guys are laughing at me. That's not cool. It was huge. I should have zoomed in. Just crop that picture next time. But, uh, it was big, believe me, it was big. And so I, I was scared of this thing, like falling on our dog and making it inside or maybe like eating our dog. It was, it's a big spider, <laughs> trust me. And so, uh, so I put our, our son inside so that he was, he was safe. And then I grabbed a rake out of our garage and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this thing out. What would James Bond do, right? So I grabbed this rake and I go out there and I'm, you know, I got the rake and I'm getting ready to take this thing out. And, and I'm like mid-swing, and I look down, like out of the corner of my eye, and there's a snake in the bush underneath of this thing. And so like a, a Dak Prescott throw, I totally missed. And, and I, hit the, I hit the web, but the spider was fine. He kind of like slowly went down to the ground. And then a few hours later, he had a nice, perfect web, and he's, he's thriving in our backyard. He's probably watching online this morning. Like he just, he has made himself at home in our backyard. But that snake about gave me a heart attack. Like... It was terrifying. And now, I think this, this uh, spider's pretty big. The snake was pretty tiny. I'm not going to lie. It was about that thick. And uh, uh, for everybody that, that raised your hands earlier that you're scared of snakes, does it matter how big they are? No. It could be tiny. It could be huge. It could be a long worm. Like, those things just creep me out. And, and so I am just not a fan of snakes. And in my mind, I assume that every single snake has one goal. Its goal is to get into my house, sneak into my bedroom, and then eat me while I'm sleeping. <laughs> I'm serious. I think that is all that any snake wants to do. They just want to, want to creep on me and then take me out when I'm not looking. And so fast forward in the story, I, I took my rake, I, took it, I put it back in the garage, I found a shovel, and now we don't have a snake problem anymore. So, uh, so you know, I... I if you have assumptions, man, they make you do some crazy things. Like, I assume that snake was coming after me, and so 
It's going to make sure that snake didn't have an opportunity to come after me. And so snake problem gone, spider problem, not so much. Spider's still there. But assumptions can cause us to do some pretty crazy things, can't they? And, and assumptions can be good. They can protect us from things like snakes, but they can also be kind of bad. You know, you assume you got the, the, the lid on your coffee cup nice and secure, and you go to drink it, and you, you don't. It's, that's a bad assumption. That happened to me on the way to church a couple weeks ago, and it was a, it was a tough morning. Um, we assume that our, our kids are born with common sense, so they won't like stick their fingers in electrical sockets or try to dive down the stairs. That's, they're not, man. That, common sense is something we have to teach. I've learned that very, very quickly. And, uh, and so we also make assumptions about other people, right? Like we make uh, assumptions about, about what they're thinking and what, they're, what they really mean with their words, or what they really mean with their actions. You know, you're, you think, you know, those people, they never invite me to hang out because I, I bet they think I'm too old. And, and so they don't, want to, they don't want me to hang out with them because, because they think I'm too old. That's not cool. I'm offended about that. Or, or that lady when I was walking out of the grocery store from Giant, she was staring at my cart and giving me the stink eye. And I think it's because I didn't use reusable bags. I think she was judging me because I wasn't using reusable bags. Or, or man, uh, you know, my coworkers, I just can't get them to eat lunch with me anymore. And I bet it's because of that one time I ate tuna fish. I'm, I'm offended that my coworkers won't eat with me because of my tuna fish. You know, we all do this, don't we? We, we interpret other people's actions and words, and then in our minds, we create all of these scenarios of what we think they were thinking, why we think they did what they did, or why they said something, and then we get all worked up over a perce- perceived slight that, that may not have even been there. And, and at that point, it's too late. You know, we've made our assumptions. We are offended, and we all make assumptions about other people, their actions, their motivations, their thought processes. And when we do that, we're opening the door for offense. We are allowing ourselves to get offended about all kinds of things that may or may not even be real. And so this morning, we're continuing our I'm Offended series by talking about the danger of assumptions. And uh, this is something that we see in the Bible. There's a, a really cool story about this in the book of Exodus. So we're kicking it old school this morning, and we're going to the Old Testament. And, uh, and in the book of Exodus, this is the second book of the Bible, and it's following a group of people known as the Israelites. And, and the Israelites, they were God's chosen people, but they were in a, a rough spot. So they've been living in Egypt, and they've been living in slavery in Egypt. And, and so they had a really, really bad time. The Bible tells us that they were subject to harsh labor working and building. They were subject to harsh labor out in the fields. The Egyptians were like super evil. They were killing the Israelite babies. Like it was just a, a really horrible time for them. But then God brought along a man named Moses. He brought along a man named Moses so that he could save the Israelites and, and rescue them out of Egypt. And so uh, Moses does his thing. And over this long period of time, and, and God brought some plagues against the Egyptians and, and this whole scenario. And then finally, the Israelites were rescued. And they were brought out of the land of Egypt. They escaped. They were so excited. They had, they had new life. And so they were on their way uh, away from Egypt. And they're on this journey out in the desert. And not long after they left Egypt, they come up to this huge sea that's basically this roadblock that's, that's blocking their way. And so let's hop in here and let's see how they respond to this roadblock. This is Exodus 14, starting in verse 10. We'll have everything on the screens this morning, but if you need a Bible, we've got free Bibles out in the lobby next to the coffee. So grab some coffee for the road, grab a Bible for the road. So this is Exodus 14, verse 10. It says, as Pharaoh approached... The Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? So the Israelites, they come across the sea that's blocking their path, and and they had nowhere to go. And then they, they look back, and they see the Egyptians are chasing after them. They think, oh my goodness, these, they're, gonna, they're coming over here, they're going to try to kill us, so they're going to put us back in slavery. And so they're scared, and, and they're starting to panic. And, and you see the reaction. They went to Moses, and they say, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? And honestly, I think this is one of the funniest verses in the whole Bible. Like, this is a serious situation, very heavy situation. But I think it's really funny that they, they were scared for their lives, but they had time to get sassy with Moses. They were like... <laughs> come on, man, like, why'd you go to all the trouble of rescuing us from slavery if you were going to kill us anyway? And so I, I think that's really funny, but, but their reaction, it tells us a lot about where their heart was at. 
You know, it tells us a lot about what they were thinking. And as soon as they faced a challenge, they were so quick to forget about everything Moses had done for them, everything that God had done for them. You know, Moses had rescued them out of Egypt. He had pulled them out of slavery and their harsh oppression. And then he led them away from this land where life was terrible. And, and they were now in freedom. Like, they should have been rejoicing. Moses should have been their hero forever because of that. But as soon as there was a little hiccup in their relationship and something went wrong, they turned on him because they assumed the worst. They assumed that Moses was trying to have them killed. Think about that. Moses, who spent all this time, risked his life for them, did all of this to rescue them out of Egypt. One thing goes wrong, and they were so quick to assume that he was out to get them. And, and that's the danger of assumptions. So if you're taking notes this morning, we have one big idea today, and, and we can toss this up on the screen. We prevent offense by assuming the best. We prevent offense by assuming the best. When something goes wrong, that opens up some gray area. And, and whether that's a, a mean look, whether that's a text that doesn't have enough emojis or enough exclamation points, whether that's not enough invites to hang out or, or maybe way too many invites to hang out, in our relationships with our, our family, with our spouse, with complete strangers, there is always gray area where we don't know what the other person is thinking. And, and we choose what we do with that gray area. We make a choice about how we fill that. And so we can fill that by assuming the worst, by assuming that, that the other person is inconsiderate or, or they're out to get us or they don't care, care about us. You know, there's endless negativity that we can fill that gray area with or... We can fill the space of the unknown by assuming the best, by assuming that the person had, had good intentions and they didn't, they didn't mean to come after us. We can assume that there was a, if there was a misunderstanding that it was just intentional. It wasn't something purposeful. And, and filling that space with positivity, that's something that, that I tend to struggle with. Like that is a, that's a weak area for me. And if, if one of my friends is, is acting a little bit strange or, or, or not communicating as much as normal, you know, my mind jumps to negative assumptions. And, and one of my good friends, he lives a few hours away now, but, but we've known each other for like 13 or 14 years, ever since we started school together. And we're always just kind of texting about something random. And, and a few months ago, he was just acting a little different. Like his texts were shorter. It was a long time in between when he would respond and, and he would just go long periods without talking. He was, he was a lot more negative about everything. Like you know when you're texting somebody and you're like, man, isn't it beautiful out today? Like it's 75 and sunny. And they're like, yeah, but those UV rays are going to get you. You know, he was just a little negative. And, and so my mind started jumping to all of these assumptions. And, and so I assumed he was, he was upset at me because he wasn't communicating. His messages were shorter. And, and once I decided that he was upset at me, man, I started making assumptions of why he would be upset at me. And I started thinking through my actions, and I was like, well, he doesn't have a reason to be upset with me because I didn't do anything wrong. That's not cool. Why are you upset with me? And, and all of that, it led me to create some space in our friendship because of all these scenarios in my mind that I was getting offended about. And, and it was so ridiculous. And, and so at this point, I had started to, to act differently because I'm offended about how he was acting. And so finally, I just, I just asked him, like, hey, how are you doing? Like, like what's going on? And, and, and it turns out, um, he wasn't mad at me at all. Shocker, right? <laughs> Turns out he was, he was unhappy at his job. He was trying to get a different job, but he didn't, he didn't get accepted to that job. He had some relationship stuff going on with his family and, and some close friends and, and all this stuff, but it was never about me. In my mind, I had made this whole scenario where it was about me, but it wasn't. And so, so while I was overthinking his actions and I was getting all offended, he was going through all these struggles and I wasn't there for him while he was going through those struggles because I thought he was, he was upset at me and I, I allowed offense to come into our friendship. And, and that may sound crazy to you, but man, this is something we all do. We all overthink things and, and we make assumptions about what other people are thinking and we choose what we fill these gray areas with in our relationships. And the offense that comes from, from assumptions, it's avoidable. It's something that is completely avoidable, but we have to make an effort to fill that space with positivity and not negatives. We have to choose to assume the best in others because that's how we prevent offense. Now, the Israelites, they failed at this. You know, when there was gray area on their journey out of Egypt, they immediately assumed the worst. They insulted Moses. They ignored all of the good that he had done for them. And 
and they projected bad intentions on him, and, and not only to Moses, but they also projected bad intentions on God. Moses was the man that helped them escape from Egypt, and it was God who created the miracles that allowed them to, to be free. It was God who had rescued them, and, and even after everything God had rescued them from, they still didn't believe that he wanted what was best for them. And, and I think that's something we can relate to. When there's gray area in our relationships with, with others, we can tend to assume bad intentions on them, but we also tend to assume bad intentions on God. We think, God, if you really cared about me, like you wouldn't let me go through all of these struggles. I wouldn't be fi- facing financial struggles if God really cared about me. I wouldn't be dealing with, with relationship challenges and health challenges if God really cared about me. I wouldn't have to work so hard and, and struggle so much if God really cared about me. We think that, right? But, but that's assuming the worst of God. That's seeing gray area and, and allowing negativity to fill that void. And, and I know in my life I've experienced this. It was uh, like nine years ago on Labor Day weekend that um, I, had a, a, I got a bad injury. I had a bad concussion. And I've shared that full story with you guys before. But basically, I hit my head. And for the next nine months, it was just a long recovery where I was at home in my bed. I couldn't really talk to people. I couldn't really walk. It was just a, a bad situation in my whole life got flipped upside down, and, and my recovery was like a, a roller coaster. Like I would, I would start to feel better after a few weeks. I'd try to go back to work, and then I'd hit a setback, and I'd be back on the couch, laying in a room by myself for a month. And then I'd, I'd start to feel better, and I'd try to go to work and try to do some things, and then boom, setback. I'm back at home for two months, doing nothing, wearing sunglasses in my living room with all the shades closed because I, I couldn't, couldn't see anything. And, and so after just months and months of that, I was just exhausted and, and I would pray and, and ask God, what in the world am I supposed to be learning from this? Like, it just goes on and on and on. And, and I felt like I'd been through enough pain. I felt like I'd been through enough where it should just be over. I felt like the whole situation just needed to end so that I could get back to being healthy and be like a real person again. And there was so much gray area during that year of my life. And I didn't know God's purpose at, at all. I just knew the reality of the struggle that I was in each and every day. And my instinct was to fill that space with negativity, you know, to assume that God wasn't doing what was best for me, to assume that, that he was allowing me to suffer too much. My instinct was to allow myself to get, get offended about my situation and think how things could be different and things should be different. When there's gray area, it's, it's so easy to get offended. But what helped me during that time, and, and I believe what can help us from allowing our circumstances to cause us to be offended by God is to remember the promises that the Bible tells us about him. You know, being reminded about God's character, how he loves us, how he has a plan for us, how he watches over us, that's what's going to prevent us from making negative assumptions about him. It gives us something good and true that we can hold on to when there's space for us to make negative assumptions. And, and one of these that I want to show you comes from Psalm uh, chapter 36, and we'll put this on the screen. I love these two verses. Um, Psalm 36, starting in verse 5, it says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. And a couple of verses down in verse 7, it says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. God's love for you is huge, and his love will will not fail. He's going to be faithful to you. He will not change his mind. God loves you today, and he's going to love you tomorrow. And no matter what trials and pain you experience, God will always love you. God will always be there for you. And those are promises we can hold on to that, that are going to help us to assume the best when there's gray area in our relationship with Jesus. And in, in the section we read from Exodus, the Israelites, they chose not to focus uh, on the good that God had done for them. They chose to just focus on, on the negativity. And God had done so much for them. He was so faithful. He orchestrated a, a miracle to rescue them. And all they focused on was the next obstacle that came up. Now, how many of you guys know there's going to be a next obstacle for each and every one of us? It might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be big, it might be small, but life is full of obstacles, but we choose how we respond to those obstacles. We can, we can panic, and we can forget about all the good that God has done for us, and, and just forget about his promises and his love for us, and we can start making negative assumptions about him and our situation, or we can choose to trust that God is still good, regardless of what we're facing. 
We can choose to remember what God has done for us, to remember that the Bible tells us he'll always love us, he'll always protect us, he'll always look out for us. The Israelites, they chose option number one. They, they got caught up in their fear and they forgot about God's greatness. So they, they panicked and they were afraid. And what did God do? He rescued them. He rescued them from that situation where the Egyptians were chasing after them. He, he took care of them because he loved them and, and they didn't need to panic They didn't need to make negative assumptions about him because they could have always trusted in him because he was always going to take care of them and he's always going to take care of us. And and so we have have so many reasons to trust God, so many reasons to assume the best in him. But I think what can be a lot more challenging sometimes is assuming the best in in other people, assuming that they have good intentions, assuming that they're looking out for us. And and guys, I got to share a, a pastor confession story with you guys. Um, so last week I was working on, on this message. And usually when I'm working on messages, I, I work from home because it's, it's just me and I can focus and it's, it's just easy to, to knock work out there. And so um, I, I was working on our message at home and, and our air conditioning has been a little spotty lately. So like it, it'll work for most of the day and then around like three or four, it starts to struggle to keep up. And, and so the day that I was writing this message, it just wasn't working, like right from the beginning of the day. So I started my day, I, I made a call over to our AC company, and I was like, hey, you know, would you be able to come out and, and repair our unit sometime? And this was like when it was like up in 100 degrees every single day. And, and so while I was talking on the phone to them, I mentioned like, hey, we've got a maintenance contract. You know, it was like a one-year thing we did it last summer. And so if you guys come out, like that's, that's free, you know? Like I wasn't trying to be rude, but I was like, that's part of our contract. And so I was letting them know. And, and the lady was, lady was being a little sketchy. She was like, oh, I, I don't really know when we're going to be able to get out to you guys. I don't really see anything on the schedule. I'll have to call you back. And she's like, oh, I also don't see your contract here. So I don't really know what that's about either. But yeah, I'll call you back sometime. So that wasn't the best phone call, not, not the best way to start the day. So a few hours pass and the sun comes out. It's getting close to 100 degrees outside. It's getting closer to 100 degrees inside. It's, you know, rising. And as the temperature's rising inside, my patience is falling very, very quick. And, and I start to wonder if the AC company was ever going to call me back. And, and so I started to get a little bit salty. And I was like, I don't think they're going to call me back. And so I was like, you know what? I bet they're not going to find my contract either. So I, I went through my email and I found my contract so that if they ever called me back, I would have it there. you would be like, hey, these are the dates. Like, I got this. And, and so I, I was getting a little upset. And so I'm, I'm looking at my, uh, my contract with them. I realized that it expired a week from that day. So I started thinking, you know what? I bet my AC company has my contract. And they're going to wait to come service my AC for eight days when they can come charge me for it. That makes sense, right? All of this is going through my head while I'm writing a message about assuming the best in people. (laughs) Just a a complete pastor fail right there. Like I was assuming, fully assuming all the worst and then making all these negative assumptions. So look, you might be here today and you're like, this message is lame. This is not for me. Well, it's for me. I need this. So look with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll put this on the screen. Um, Here, Paul, he's teaching about what our love should look like. And love is a a huge thing in the Bible. Um, It talks about how we should love others. This is a big part of Jesus' teachings. And so um, speaking of love, let's look at what he says. He says, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. So if we're loving in our relationship, then we're going to trust that the people we're interacting with have good intentions. We're going to always hold out hope that their actions towards us are are positive. Trusting and hoping, man, it's so much easier when everything's solid, when our relationships are good, when we know that we're on good terms. But when there's gray area, it's hard to trust and it's hard to have hope. And, and, And when we don't know what someone else is thinking, our minds can do some crazy stuff. We can go down some crazy rabbit trails and we think somebody, somebody's mad at us. We can start going through all the scenarios of what happened and we start justifying what we did and, and, and looking at flaws in the way that they acted. And before we know it, we're the one who's offended because we're thinking back to how they should have acted differently. And, and all of that is just a, a nasty negative spiral that happens when we don't assume the best. When the AC didn't come, uh, company didn't call me back all day, when the temperature in my house was rising and it was almost 90 degrees in my living room, 
that opened up some gray area. And, and in that gray area, like I could fill that space with anything I wanted. And, and so I could fill it with, with negative assumptions, assuming they were out to get me and they were trying to take advantage of me or I, that's what I did. But what I should have done is, is I should have assumed the best. Think about how they're, they were probably busy. They probably had other houses to get to. And when we love the people around us, we assume the best of them. We, we trust that they have good intentions. We believe that they have good motives. And, and our love covers all of that gray area with trust, positivity, and the last attitude that we see in this verse, which is perseverance. And, and perseverance is so important in our love. It's so important if we're going to commit to avoid offense because we all make mistakes. We all do things that offend the people around us, but real love is committed to carry on through offense, to carry on through mistakes, to carry on through trials. And and we can toss this next verse on the screen. This is Proverbs 19, verse 11. It says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. If we're wise, we'll show patience to others. We'll choose to let go of things that they do that offend us. And and as we close, I got one more thought for us. So this is something that I hope we can take into our week something I hope that we can apply to our relationships. And we'll put this on the screen. We choose to assume the best. We choose to show patience. We choose to overlook mistakes and offense. If you think back to what we read about about the Israelites, they had it rough. Like they had been in slavery for years. It was miserable and unbearable. And then then finally they escape Egypt and they have some hope and belief for a better future. And then they hit another trial. And that must have been so demoralizing for them. They must have just been thinking like, man, can I, can I not catch a break? They escape one trial, they enter into another one. And look, we, we usually don't get to choose the circumstances that we're in, but we always get to choose how we respond. We always get to choose how we respond to trials, how we respond to gray area, how we respond to conflict and offense. And every time we have the opportunity to respond, my prayer is that we will choose to assume the best, choose to show patience, choose to overlook mistakes and offense. And and so this week, think about how your relationships will improve if you show more trust, if you show more faith, if you overlook offenses and and assume the best. How will your conversations with your spouse be be more positive and loving if you assume the best? How will your relationships with your friends and and your family improve if you assume the best? Of them, and, and how much less offended will you be if you choose to fill all of the gray area in your relationships by assuming the best? We will avoid offense if we assume the best. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for giving us examples of, of how people that loved you made mistakes. And, and I thank you that you are gracious with us when we make mistakes. And I pray, God, that we can learn from the Israelites and, and learn from our own mistakes and and assume the best of the people around us. I pray that we will, we will love them, that we will uh, care about them, and that we will show trust in, in them and trust for good intentions. And, and God, I pray that we'll show that trust for you when, when life is hard, when, when situations are really difficult. I pray that we will always give you the benefit of the doubt and believe that, that you're looking out for us and believe that you have a great plan for us and that you love us dearly no matter what we're experiencing. We are so grateful for you and the lives you've given us. I pray that you will help us to make the most of each and every day that we have. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Bayshore Podcast. I want to encourage you to take this message you just received and allow it to go deep into your soul and let Jesus do the deep work that only he can do. A special thanks to everyone that gives generously to Bayshore. It's because of you that this ministry is possible, creating life change all over the world. You can be a part of spreading the message around the world by going to bayshore.online and clicking give. For all things Bayshore, visit bayshore.online to find out what your next step may be. You can subscribe right here and share this podcast with your friends and family. Thank you again for listening. God bless you.